Math 1332, Chapter 2, Set Theory, Section 2.1, Introduction to Set Theory, Video 7, Equal Sets and Equivalent Sets. This is the final video for Section 2.1, and it discusses two fairly intuitive concepts, but they're also pretty easy to get mixed up with each other. The, the concept of equal sets versus equivalent sets. Let's start with definitions. Two sets A and B are equal. Should have underlined the word equal there. If there's two conditions, but they're very similar. Condition number one, every element of set A is also an element of set B. There's a way to write that symbolically. It uses a little bit of what's going to happen in chapter 3, but I'll go ahead and show it to you. You could also write this by saying x is an element of a, and then draw this double arrow, or single arrow, actually, and then say x is an element of b. This is a little bit ahead of where we are right now, but this arrow is the symbol for the word implies. So you would read this x is an element of A implies x is an element of B. In other words, if something belongs to set A, then it must also belong to set B. The other part of the definition of being equal sets is the same thing in reverse. If every element of B is also an element of A. So symbolically, we could say that x is an element of b implies x is an element of a. Again, the arrow symbolizing the word implies is a symbol of what's called symbolic logic, which is what chapter 3 is about. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but both of these say the same thing. If you belong to one set, then you must belong to the other, and vice versa. So you can't be in one but not the other. You have to be in both. Intuitively, it just says that they have the same elements. That's the loosey-goosey definition. Two sets are equal if they have the identically the same elements. Which is the same as saying if you belong to one, then you belong to the other, regardless of which one you call first. Now what about equivalent? Actually, before we get to equivalent, let's take a look at these examples. I've got six sets listed over here. A, B, C, D, F, remember E is reserved, and the natural numbers. Missing a semicolon here. Now we're going to do two things with these. We're going to answer two questions. Which sets are equal? Which sets are equivalent? We haven't defined equivalent yet, but we can answer which sets are equal. Remember, equal basically means they contain the exact same elements. Now if the elements already listed, like in set A, which is in roster form, it's easy to see what its elements are. A contains the numbers 1, 4, 9, 16, and 25. But for a set that's in set builder notation, like B, we may have to list them in roster form to see what the elements are. B is the set of all X's such that X is an element of the natural numbers, so it belongs to the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, and is between 10 and 16, not including the 10, not including the 16. You can tell it doesn't include because it doesn't say or equals to like this one does. So what does B contain? Well, it contains natural numbers between 10 and 16. That would be 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. And instantly we can determine that A and B are not equal. They do not contain the same elements. A contains 1, but B doesn't. B contains 15, but A doesn't. In fact, they don't contain any common elements at all. So A is not equal to B. Now set C is a little bit, I'm gonna rewrite this, leave me some space. Set C is in set builder notation, but it uses something that we haven't used before. Let me rewrite set E, which was the set of X's such that, I'm sorry, that was not set E, that was set F. The set of X is such that X is an element of the even numbers or X is an element of the odd numbers. And then we have the natural numbers. Okay, but well, let's get back to set C and see what it contains. 
Set C is in set builder notation, but it doesn't start off with just an X. It's the set of X squareds, or X to the second powers, such that X is a natural number and X is less than or equal to five. Well, I know what this is. These are the natural numbers less than or equal to five. One, two, three, four, five. But what this is saying is I want the set of squares of these numbers. So in other words, set C contains one squared, two squared, three squared, four squared, and five squared. You probably remember that to square a number means to multiply it by itself. So we could work out all of these. One times one is one, two times two is four, three times three is nine, four times four is 16, and five times five is 25. Wait a second. One, four, nine, 16, 25. One, four, nine, 16, 25. Set A and set C are equal. So let's go ahead and write A equals C, because we just found out that it is. Now what is set D? Set D is gonna be tricky to list, but not impossible. Set D says the set of all X's such that X is a rational number which means that it's core, it's a fraction, but it's between zero and one. So all the fractions between zero and one. In the second video about special sets, I mentioned that we cannot list all the fractions in order from least to greatest and have all of them. They're too densely packed. But I didn't say we couldn't list them all in some order. There is a way to list every single fraction between zero and one in a predictable order. You start with all the halves, one half. So you only have between zero and one. Then you pick up all the thirds, starting with one third. One third and two thirds. Those are the only thirds between zero and one. The next one would be three thirds, which would equal one. The one prior would be zero thirds, which is zero. So we're not including either one of those. Then you would pick up the fourths, starting with one fourth, two fourths, three-fourths. Now you may be thinking two-fourths, that reduces to one-half and it's already listed. And you would be correct, in which case we would just strike it out because we're being redundant. So now I've got all the fourths accounted for, then all the fifths, so one-fifth, two-fifths, three-fifths, four-fifths, and that's all of them. And we would just continue that pattern forever. We would bump up the denominator by one, and then cycle the numerators from one all the way up until they match the denominator. So for example, for five, from one all the way up until four. And if we got any fraction that reduced, we would throw it out because it would reduce to a fraction that was already listed earlier. So we can list all of these fractions. This is an infinite set. It's clearly not equivalent to these. Excuse me, it's clearly not equal to these. This contains fractions, these don't. What is set F? Well, set F is the set of all X's such that X is an even number or X is an odd number. Now, if I said and, it would be an empty set because you can't be even and odd at the same time. But this says you're even or odd. Well, is one even or odd? Yes. And just for the purist out there who happen to be watching this video, I am going to throw in the stipulation that X is an element of the natural numbers. So no negative numbers, because negative numbers can be even and odd, as is zero, which is even. But let's just say that we're focusing solely on, on natural numbers, and if you go back to video two when we define special sets, we did stipulate that when we say even or odd, we do mean natural numbers. So let's start going through the natural numbers, starting with one. Is one even or odd? Yes, it's odd. Is two even or odd? Yes, it's even. And by the way, when I say even or odd, that means it just has to be one or the other. It could be both, but it never will be. It's like saying, raise your hand if you're male or female. Chances are everybody's gonna raise their hand because chances are you're one or the other. Chances are. Is three even or odd? Yep. So is four, et cetera, et cetera. When we take the union of the evens and odds, we just get all of the natural numbers. Remember, the natural numbers start at one, two, three, four, and keep going. So I found two more equal sets. Set F 
and sent in contain the exact same elements. Set F and the natural numbers, I should say. So of the six sets on the board, those are the only two that are equal, the only pairs that are equal. A and C both contain 1, 4, 9, 16, and 25. F and N both contain all of the natural numbers. So equal is pretty easy. You have the same elements. But what about equivalent? I'm going to define equivalent in two different ways, depending upon if your sets are finite or infinite. Two finite sets are equivalent if the cardinalities are equal. The cardinality of A equals the cardinality of B. Recall that the symbol for cardinality is an N with parentheses around the set, and it means the number of elements. Two infinite sets are equivalent if they can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence. One-to-one -one correspondence with each other. Remember when I matched up my fingers? That was a one-to-one -one correspondence. So if you're not sure what that means, go back and watch video six in this section. So now that we've got all these sets, we can answer which ones are equivalent. There is a symbol for equivalent, but we don't use it in this class. So we'll just say, well, I'll make up a symbol. We're gonna use a wavy equal sign, which means they're not equal, but there's something equal about them. In this case, it's the number of elements they have. Do you see any two sets that contain the same number of elements? Yeah, I see three of them. A, B, and C all contain five elements. A is equivalent to, and I'm gonna change my symbol, I'm gonna put the equal sign with the wavy over it. I haven't used a symbol for equivalent between sets lately, and it's bothering me that I can't remember if it's the equal with the wavy over it or the wavy equal sign. But regardless, we're going to use that for equivalent too. No, I'm not. I'm going to use the wavy equal sign. Now that is not industry standard. So if you're watching this series of videos, but you're not my student or a student at the school I teach at, Tyler Junior College, and be wary of using that symbol. But A is equivalent to B because both contain five elements, one, two, three, four, five. And B is equivalent to C. They're all equivalent to each other because they all contain five elements. It should be pretty evident that two equal sets are always equivalent. Because if they're equal, they contain the exact same elements, which means they must contain the exact same number of elements. But equivalent doesn't always mean equal. A and B are equivalent. A and B are not equal. What about D, F, and N? Well, F and N contain the exact same elements. They're equal, therefore they have to be equivalent. So we know F is equivalent to N. But what about D? Is D equivalent to either F or N? Because remember, those two are already equivalent. The answer actually is yes. Because if we were to list out all these fractions and didn't pause when we wrote one that reduced, we write the halves, the thirds, the fourths, but if we go, it's going to reduce, I don't write it, and we keep going, then yes, we can put these sets in one-to-one -one correspondence with each other. D has a half, a third, two-thirds, one-fourth. We don't write two-fourths because it reduces to a half. Three-fourths, and then all the fifths, one-fifth, two-fifths, three-fifths, and four-fifths, and so on. Again, not writing any set. That, uh, excuse me, any fraction that's reducible because it would reduce to a fraction that was already listed. And then we write all the integers, excuse me, the natural numbers below it. One, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Then yes, it's pretty easy to put a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two sets. And we could do it forever. Every fraction would pair up with one natural number, every natural number would pair up with one fraction. Since those infinite sets can be put in correspondence with one-to-one -one correspondence with each other, they are defined to be equivalent. Uh, that was D. So we have six sets up here in, in what would be called two equivalence classes. A, B, and C are equivalent to each other. 
d, f, and m. Finite is easy, you have the same number of elements. Infinite, not so easy. Now you might be thinking, well, aren't all infinite sets equivalent? Actually, the answer is no. The set of real numbers, all the decimals, terminating, repeating, or not, is not equivalent to the natural numbers. In fact, it's larger. Not to mess with your head too much, but there are two si there's more than one size of infinity. And uh, at the end of this chapter, I believe it's at the end of this chapter, we'll talk about those different sizes of infinity and revisit sets being equivalent. But for now, not all infinite sets are equivalent. Only if you can put them in one-to-one -one correspondence. The real numbers can't do it. Can't put it in one-to-one -one correspondence. Uh, I'll show you that later. Even if you take all the decimals between 0 and 1, oh, there's my camera. Even if you take all the decimals between 0 and 1, you can't put them in one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers. But don't, don't worry about that much for now. Um, just know that equivalent means you have the same number of elements if you're finite. If you're infinite, it means you can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with each other. And honestly, the one-to-one -one correspondence definition is sufficient. These are equivalent, A, B, and C, because they can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence. One with one squared, four with two squared, nine with three squared, 16 with four squared, 25 with five squared, or one paired with 11, four paired with 12, nine paired with 13, 16 paired with 14, 25 paired with 15. So it would be sufficient just to use the one-to-one -one correspondence definition, but the concept of equivalent is you have the same number of elements. And when you're finite, that is sufficient. Uh, when you're infinite, it's not. It's a little tricky, but I wouldn't worry about it too much. Just remember, equal means you are exactly the same. Equivalent means you have the same number of elements. 